introduce myself um, as well as today's uh, session. So this is the Teaching to Transgress uh, conversation um, with Jay Dolmage, uh, focusing particularly on academic ableism today. Um, I want to welcome you all to this speaker series. It's something that we really look forward to within the Center for Teaching and Learning, and we're really excited to see the impact uh, that some of these sessions have had, and we know today will be impactful as well. My name is Emma McCallum. I am an Education and Learning Coordinator for the Center of Teaching and Learning, as well as the Human Rights and Equity Office here at Queen's University. I'm a white queer person with chronic illness and disability. I have mid-length brown hair. I'm wearing a red button-up shirt today and clear round glasses. I'm currently in my home office. Um, the walls are painted gray and there's two white doors behind me, as well as there's some shelves with some plants on them to my left also behind me. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. Before we start uh, with the conversation, I really want to acknowledge uh, the land uh, that Queen's University is situated upon, um, and that's the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. The territory is included in the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It's my understanding that the Dish with One Spoon Covenant for foregrounds reciprocal responsibility, considering the land that we are on as a dish that can provide sustenance if collectively, if collective responsibility is taken to ensure that the dish is never empty and always shared. The Dish with One Spoon Covenant commits those living and benefiting on this land or from this dish to share in the obligations of upholding these commitments to peace, reciprocity, and respecting sovereignty. As for myself, I'm an uninvited guest on this land, joining in from Takaranto today, or so-called Toronto, as many people know it. Takaranto is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron, Wendat, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Takaranto is also governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I also, when I join in things online and facilitate online, I always like to really think about how this cyberspace or this virtual space is not disconnected from the land, but rather to think about how cyberspace is really informed and impacted by colonialism and its many concurrent projects, including but not limited to anti-Blackness, racism, capitalism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. In particular, I think about the colonial implications of resource extraction and labor exploitation in the name of technology and so-called progress, I think of the surveillance that this technology allows and the ever expanding digital access gap that's been further aggravated by, the, by COVID-19 and the economic recession. At the same time, I urge you to think about the imagination, creativity, resistance, world-making and revolutionary possibility um, that we can bring to this space and how folks have and might continue to use this power and our leadership skills to be accountable to this land. I also wanna highlight the connections um, between the land and what it is that we're here to do today and the conversations we're uh, intending to have and really think about how the land, anti-colonial solidarity and the conversation we're joining in today about Jay Dolmudge's work on academic ableism can't be separated. Um, ableism and colonialism are deeply intertwined systems benefiting from one another and compounding one another, uh, especially through education and the processes and values and systems that academia relies upon. Um, so just sitting with all of that today, uh, and really thinking about those connections and how it all comes together and how um, I view and how I view all of our, our responsibility in relation to all of these different context pieces and the land. Um, so as I've said as well, uh, today is today's talk is a part of the Teaching to Transgress speaker series. It's a series inspired by Bell Hook's critical work on liberatory practices and pedagogy. Uh, in her book, Teaching to Transgress, Education as a Practice for Freedom, Bell Hooks encourages us to think of the classroom as a space to transgress boundaries, a space that connects the will to know with the will to become. Hooks argues for the possibility and potential in education and how it cannot be without critical reflection and, and interrogation of what Hooks calls the biases and curricula that reinscribe systems of domination. It is through this process of critical thinking and engaged pedagogy that education may become a practice for freedom and that the classroom, a space where liberatory practices can be imagined and rehearsed. Inspired by Hook's work and legacy, our goal is to promote quality teaching, educational leadership, and capacity building at the Center for Teaching and Learning. We're really proud to present this series, a series which features radical thinkers, practitioners, and pedagogues to foster the exchange of critical and innovative pedagogies and teaching practices. 
instead of a presentation, we like to think of this as a conversation with our guests, um, with you all as well who are joining in today, um, and to think with folks and to think about different teaching philosophies and practices and ways that folks kind of emerged into these practices within their careers, um, as well as the political commitments that folks bring to their work and the values that, that they frame their teaching and learning through. To learn more about the Centre for Teaching and Learning, please check out our website at www.queensu.ca slash CTL. That makes me feel like I'm on the radio or on TV. I've never gotten to say that. <laughs> um, please note that today's session will be recorded. Um, we'll stop the recording when we go into the audience Q&A, um, but for now it will be recorded and shared. Um, the chat and uh, your uh the chat will be turned off for the duration of the, the Q&A between myself and Jay, um, but then we will turn it back on for, for questions. Um, if a question comes to mind, please note it down. And then when we uh, open up the chance for audience questions, you're more than welcome to share then. Uh, live transcription has been turned on and you can access that, uh, the live transcript by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Um, all right, I think that's it for all of the things that I wanted to say to introduce us today. Um, I'd really like to now introduce uh, Professor Jay Dolmudge. Uh, Jay Dolmudge is the chair of English at the University of Waterloo, the author of three books, Disability Rhetoric, Academic Ableism, and Disabled Upon Arrival. He's also the founding editor of the Canadian Journal for Disability Studies, which is an open access journal. He's committed to disability rights in his teaching, working to bring together writing, rhetoric, and critical ped pedagogy concerning disability. In Jay's second book, Academic Ableism, of which I'm a big fan, I've spent quite a bit of time reading over the past couple of years, um, he looks at the relation between higher education and disability. Jay examines the ways that disability has been constructed in opposition to higher education, arguing that higher education is inaccessible by design, creating what Jay calls steep steps to ivory towers. Jay's book, Academic Ableism, brings together institutional critique and disability studies to unpack the processes, infrastructure, and popular media narratives around higher education that reflect and re-ingrain ableism. Jay argues that disability, accessibility, and inclusive education are vital to making higher education a radically better space for everyone. So before we begin with questions, I wanna give Jay the opportunity to introduce yourself as well. Um, thanks so much for being here. We're so excited to chat with you. Yes, thanks so much for having me and um, such an interesting kind of series and way of going about doing this. So um, I'm honored to be here. and I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, my name's Jay and I am a cisgendered white dude. I'm sitting in my office right now, which is kind of cluttered. There's lots of papers behind me. There's even uh, a Muppet of me behind me. Uh, I have short hair. I'm wearing a, a green and blue short sleeve shirt. I'm wearing short sleeve shirts for as much longer as I can. Uh, and I have dark glasses that, that pretty much define my face. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, I've been working here at the University of Waterloo for uh, over a decade now. Um, and I've had some kind of nice interactions, in fact, with some of the people in the room. So, so nice to see people and I'm looking forward to meeting new people as well. Amazing, thanks so much, Jay. Um, okay, so I think to start us off, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about your teaching trajectory. Uh, who are the thinkers who've influenced you and who you are as an educator today? Sure. So um, it's a great question. And I, I, my answer is probably maybe a little bit unconventional, but I go really far back for this. So um, there are two two people in my life, part, part of my family that I think about um, in terms of my trajectory with learning. Um, and the first was someone who I was very close with, my brother, Matt. And um he and I grew up together uh, with my sister Leah in um, in a very small town called Gravenhurst, Ontario. Uh, when my sister and I began going to school, my brother's older than me, um, I realized that he was not going to my school. Um, so he was bused to a segregated school where they really just learned life skills, um, which is kind of just, you know, not much uh, in Bracebridge, Ontario. And so in the morning, I'd get on my bike and and go to school and he would get on a bus and go away. Um, and it was really hard, to be honest. It was it was really alienating. He and I shared a bedroom, but there was this disconnect growing because I had these connections in the community and neighborhood. I walked in, or biked with other kids to school and, and I could see how what the toll was on him. Um, 
we, my family took a year away. We lived in Vancouver for a year where my parents went back to school and my sister and my brother and I, we all went to school together there. So we realized that that could be done. And when we came back, we, we fought all the way up to the Ontario Supreme Court of Appeal for my brother's right to go to school in his neighborhood, in his community, to be in a regular school. Um, and we lost. This was the early 80s. Um, this was Dalmage versus Muskoka Board of Education. So we moved. We moved to another school board where we knew that he could go to school um, in, in the regular school. And so, I mean, I guess to begin with, my, my, a lot of my early learning took place in hospitals and uh, courts. Uh, but when I was then in the school, um, I knew how, how, how much it was worth fighting for inclusion. Uh, I knew that in, in a lot of ways, I'd be, if I'm being honest, I knew the cost of exclusion was so high. Um, and then I grew, grew to know over my years in, in school with my brother that that inclusion was often fake too, right? That, that, that even when he was being included, there were so many other things happening that, that, um, that told people not to include him. <laughs> you know, the, the, there were messages built into the system. Um, I didn't know to call it ableism at the time, but, um, you know, I just saw that, uh, and so that really inflected my own education, right? And my own learning. The other piece for me was that my uncle Robert, um, my, my mother's brother, when he was born, he was institutionalized. My mother, my mother never got to meet him. So he never came home. Um, and uh, he was sent to the Huronia Regional Center, which is a, was the largest institution in North America. It was massive. Um, and you may know a little bit about it because there's now been a class action, successful class action lawsuit against the province of Ontario for the fact that it was, you know, a place where people were were, were abused. They were not taught. It was for, for some time called uh, school for the feeble minded. There was no education. Um, it was a hospital school at one time and there was terrible health care. I mean, my brother, uh, my uncle Robert died um, of the flu uh, when he was nine years old. Um, and I didn't know much about him because he wasn't talked about that much in our family because of that, again, cost of segregation, cost of exclusion. Um, but the town that we moved to for my brother to go to school with my sister and I was Aurelia, which is this institutional town. And so, so many of the experiences that I had growing up uh, and so many of the experiences that my brother had growing up were inflected by the fact that this was the largest employer in town. Um, and so, I mean, it kind of, you can see maybe in some ways, if you've read academic ableism, the way that those things would shape how I come to understand an institution as large as a university. Institutions that were built at the same time, in many ways look very much the same as institutions where people were segregated and abused. Um, there's always been a research relationship and Queens is, is very much part, has been part of this in Ontario, a research relationship in which folks who were institutionalized and incarcerated were used as research subjects, right? And that that inflects this idea that disability is something we study, um, but not that disabled people are researchers or students or professors. Um, and so the, uh, that's a long answer, but that truly is, the, that's my been my learning tra trajectory. That's been the introduction that I had to education. And it's been the background background against which all of my own experiences, some of them very privileged. I, I've always um, understood that those things were happening against this backdrop of the, 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 you know, that other people's rights were being taken away, right? Um, and that it was systemic, right? From the government, government all the way down to the, 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 you know, kind of microaggressions that were experienced in the hallways and classrooms. Um, and so as I continue, I've never left education, right? Um, but I've always known that there's another different role for disability. I've always known that there's a value in listening to um, disabled people and creating space for us to um, shape the future of education against that backdrop. Um, long answer, but that's my answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I find um, what you were sharing about about personal experience and lived experience that often at least for myself and I imagine for many other folks is a huge touch point when they come to disability justice or um, these different sorts of frames folks often find it through lived experience and um, 
it, it's interesting to to hear your experience and to um think about your your text now with that knowledge as well um hearing you talk about uh, hospitals and courts as places that you learned about disability and places that you reflected on education. I'm wondering then through that process, how did you, how, how did you come to conceptualize disability justice? How do you conceptualize disability justice now? Um, does disability and justice influence your practice and in teaching? And if so, how? Sure. Um, so uh, I think one thing, it's, it creates a segue here in a way, right? So like, as I became a student, right, a, a university student, um, after I got through the period of trying to just figure out who I was and how to get to class and those kinds of things, um, and I began to sort of become really interested in learning, um, I noticed disability wasn't there, right? And I just never believed it. Uh, and I think I was lucky in a way that I that I was a student in the in the '90s and, and early 2000s as disability studies as an academic field was emerging. So then, you know, there were other people also saying this can't be right. You know, in my first book, Disability Rhetoric, it's part part of it is saying, you know, we have this this thousands year old story <laughs> about um, about how we um, you know communicate with one another and 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 it's we've just chosen to leave disabled people out of it. And there's tons of evidence. We've chosen against the predominance of evidence, right? Of the shaping and valued role of disability in our cultures. Um, so it's not just that we're kind of like ignoring disability. It's that we've selected versions of our history that, that you know, imagine disability couldn't have been part of our culture. And it's not true. It's all, you know, and, and there's so many examples of this, right? You know, and so there are stories like this. Um, but I think the key then is, is that in whatever discipline we're in, we need to understand that disability has been very systemically not ignored, right? But actively erased. Um, and uh, that becomes part of the work, right? Um, we we have had this kind of history of what we could call rights-based arguments around disability, right? And that's very much how I grew up, right? Their right to go to school, right? Um, that only gets you so far, right? I saw what that got you. You know, you get in the door, right? And and it doesn't mean inclusion, right? The word in those days used to be integration integration versus segregation and then people said well integration is not inclusion right and then in inclusion is not equity um, and the words have shifted but the, the the truth is there's always been ways in which disabled people are not listened to right in which disabled people are erased um so those rights-based arguments which are important right they've in generally general landed us at a place where there's really temporary minimal retrofitted changes right to a system to a dominant culture and to me disability justice means starting with the value and the beauty the identity the culture of disability it means when you're looking around for disability in your discipline you're understanding how much richer your discipline can be um, when you counteract some of that erasure right and 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 ignoring right um, unfortunately, you know, in universities across the curriculum, it's not where we've started. Like I said earlier, disability is seen as something to be cured or eradicated. It's all over the curriculum. It's all over the research programs across universities like Waterloo and Queens. Um, but disability justice means starting from a, a place where we value um, and protect disability culture and identity. Um, and that's going to take time because our uh, higher education has been the place where those values get reinforced. We've taught the rest of our culture to see disability in a very limited way, right? Um, so it's not just what's happening at our universities, it's the role that universities have in kind of perpetuating that idea that disabled people are not themselves researchers, right? That they, there isn't an identity and a culture to be valued. Um, and disability studies, disability justice starts for me there, right? Um, I think, yeah, so that's that's one piece. Okay, I would also say, um, you know, that that rights-based approach is in service of the dominant 
you know, it's in service of the university continuing the ways, do it to do things the ways it has always done things, right? And we're stuck with a rights-based approach. The dominant culture never has to change, right? You just slap a, a extra time on a test or exam and, and you hope the disability goes away, right? And I'll talk more about that, I'm sure. But um, I, I just think we can't understand any of the complicated problems that we face as a society and we face some really complicated problems as a society. None of those can we, can we face or deal with or address without the leadership of disabled people. Um, and to me, that's the other piece, right? That's how, that's, it's, it's, it's going so far beyond just inclusion, right? Um, we know that, that, um, that we can't handle big, the big problems and, and questions that we have as a culture if, we, if we're not led by disabled people. I think the last four years of a pandemic has taught us that, um, but I think it's, it's true in so many other spheres, right? And the other piece from, about disability justice for me is that um, I say this so carefully, right? And then I have to unpack it, but it's an acknowledgement that ableism is never alone, right? Ableism impacts everybody, right? But it also interacts with so many other forms of discrimination. It also interacts with other all those major problems I was talking about, right? Climate change relies, uh, you know, the speed of climate change relies on ableism. Lack of housing, right? Um, income disparity. All of these things are, are wrapped into and fueled by forms of ableism. Um, so you need to understand ableism in order to dismantle them, right? But also you can never isolate able, ableism as something that, that is just about disability discrimination. It's always about other things. Um, there's a problem in disability studies in that there's a very common argument that sort of says people ignore disability, right? And I get it, but it comes from this place of like, but people understand racism, but they don't understand ableism, right? A, if people in our culture do not understand racism, right, at all, um, but it's not helpful to pit one form of discrimination in some kind of like um, uh, adding game against another, especially when they're so connected, right? Um, when ableism has been used for years to, to, to sort society, right, across a wide variety of different kinds of vectors, right, in ways that have been extremely harmful. Um, but we also can't begin to tackle um, bigger problems like racism, like uh, 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 classism, sexism, right, uh, transphobia, in, by, by ignoring ableism. Right. So I think that's a big piece of disability justice. Right. And I can kind of maybe um, give an example. I could give an example, but maybe that's enough of an answer for now. I think if you've got a great example, I'm sure that some folks who are maybe newer to this would really benefit from that or kind of seeing how this sure. applies or fits together if you're if you're comfortable with that. Sure. OK. And I'll give one that I think is really relevant to us in terms of thinking about disability on our campuses. OK, so it's an example that I that I give commonly because I think it's really actually pretty urgent right now. Um, we have these systems in place where the only time disability is ever talked about on our campuses is on our syllabi. The last line of your syllabus when it says, go to disability services if you need accommodations, right? That's part of how academic ableism works, right? It says it's just this supplementary thing. It's the last thing, right? Disability would never be part of the front of the syllabus or the week to week curriculum, but it's there at the end, right? And the hope is that nobody ever asks for any of those things. And it's pretty much coming true. Like that's what happens, right? Um, but I always say like the experiences that students have had by the time they get to college or university, the experiences they've had with disability and accommodations are so overwritten by racism in Canada. Uh, that we really have to understand it's a completely different um, prospect for a student, for, for example, a Black student or an Indigenous student to ask for an accommodation, to have a disability diagnosis, to feel that they need to disclose a diagnosis than it is for a student, a, a white student, for example, right? So those even the labels that we have for disability They've all been filtered through a school system 
in a way that, and Keith Mays, who wrote this excellent book called The Unteachable Shows, I should use the quote here, right? Educators have, quote, carved out privileged white spaces in every disability classification we've seen over the last five decades. Quote, white student protection and advancement inflects every disability diagnosis a student might see from kindergarten to grade 12, and therefore all the forms of resegregation overwrite disability on our campuses as well. I'll give you some st statistics about this, how it works in Ontario, right? Um, in the Toronto Dif District School Board, having, this is a Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario report, showed that having, quote, special education needs in high school means you are drastically less likely to go to university. And that's been getting much worse over time, not better. But most notably, being a student of color makes you much more likely to be labeled with those special education needs. Right. So that's one example of how we cannot talk about disability in Ontario at Queen's University, at Waterloo University. We cannot talk about it in the context of our students or their experience or where they want to go or where they've been without also talking about racism. Right. Colonialism. Um, and so that's that's my example. Thank you so much. I think that's so helpful to see those intersections and, and that reference as well to understand how all of these pieces fit together and how they work together um, to create the context in which, which we're operating in and the ways in which we all relate to these systems and these systems relate to us differently. So um, thank you for that. I think um, the next question that I had, I think very much feeds into what we've been talking about because uh, the question starts off with, early on in your book, you reiterate that we cannot understand academia until we interrogate it from the point of ableism. What can be understood about teaching and pedagogy when interrogated from the point of disability? Yeah, so um, I think I've answered that in some ways already, right? I mean, I think this sounds so bleak to say it out loud, but I believe it. It's true. Like there's no institution in our culture that's more ableist than higher education. Right. You, you think of the kind of defensiveness that we experience on our campuses when we want to talk about mental health or crisis. Right. Uh, you know that people will defend that by saying that they need to be rigorous. Right. Um, it's so deeply part of what we do. Right. So um, it is what makes a university work. So if you want to know how to un how a university works, you need to understand ableism. Right. Um, the forces that keep us um, teaching in, in ways that we have for the last like eight decades. Right. That stop us from having more innovative or equitable approaches to teaching and learning uh, are all kind of rooted in a in a in forms of ableism. So there's that like you can't critique the university except for through ableism. There's that. Um, and I believe it's true. Right. Um, but also, I think there's another way of looking at this that says, like, and us in this room, we're, I think we're here because we're oriented around, like, teaching to transgress, right, to doing, to doing things differently. So I think what we know probably already, but it's worth repeating, is that we should be listening to disabled teachers, staff, and especially students. And I'll give you an example of this, right? Before the pandemic, I'm only really aware of one large scale study at a university where they got together disabled students and said, hey, what accommodations would you actually like? Not li likes the wrong term. What accommodations would actually help you? Which says something about the system, right? Like nobody ever asked. Um, and the truth is like the vast 75%, three quarters of accommodations are the exact same thing, which is just extended time on tests and exams. And we've spent so much time just giving that one accommodation that we can't explore how to accommodate any of the other things, right? And yet Queen's University, like on your webpage, nobody is taking an exam on your webpage, on your homepage. They're not advertising the number of exams they give in the year, right? The students on the homepage are engaged in really interesting forms of learning. Disability Services has no time to help with that because they're stuck in a system a factory model of education. Okay, so I soapbox there for a second, but 
The one time that a university this was at the University of Illinois, they actually asked they asked 303 undergraduate students what accommodations they might need or, or what would help them. Right. And what they wanted were um, recorded lectures as videos, transcripts for those videos and lectures, and then access to course materials, including instructor notes and slides outside of the 50 minutes they met in class. Right. So that's just asynchronous learning. They were asking for this for a, for a long time, right? And then the pandemic hit and during the pandemic, right? We all pivoted to a lot of those things, despite the fact that for decades, we've been telling disabled people that they were stick, you know, stigmatizing them for even asking for those things, right? Now we know, you know, you can't learn everything in a 50 minute sprint, right? The 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 the, core, the 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 school year is organized as 12 50 minute sprints in in a 12 week sprint and you learn better when you have access to those materials outside of that like little sprint uh those sorts of things if we had listened to disabled students 20 years ago right imagine where we would be educationally right and so for me that's instructive um it's just one example right, of the ways that if we design what we're doing with and through disability, rather than around it, right, or later, um, imagine where we could be. And in, in disability, in the history of disability, there's this thing called what it's called the electronic curb cut effect, right? And it basically says that every really interesting, useful technology that we have was originally developed for disabled people. And when it was only for disabled people, it was hard to get, it was expensive, it was unwieldy, right? Um, and yet once everybody had access to it, these things were revolutionary and those things are big. I mean, truly, you know, every cool thing your smartphone does from optical character recognition to email, speech to text, text to speech, every new app you download, right? Is reliant on technology that was at one time only for disabled people. Um, and that is, to me, that's the that's the way to think about disability, right? Not as a thing to think about later, not as a thing to assume is not going to be part of what we do, but as the thing we design through, right? Uh, the, 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 it's the first place we go and ask for advice about what we should be doing in the classroom. It's the first place that we go um, when we want to innovate. And I think we should want to innovate. The homepage says you all are in, innovating. I know the Waterloo homepage is saying that I'm like never stop innovating, um, but we don't apply that to how we think about disability and accommodation and we should. That's yeah, that, that idea of innovation and how attractive that is. And then yet where it falls short in practice is so interesting. Um, I'll definitely be thinking about that um, as well as what you were saying about how these systems are set up to be rigorous and they they desire to be rigorous. I can think of how many conversations um, I've had when I was a student as well as now as a staff member where um, faculty or staff will, um, ha will, will have these conversations where um, new questions emerge and new opportunities emerge to really redirect to thinking about something like disability justice that, that start at the place of but don't we need to be rigorous and don't we need this to be difficult and don't we need to prepare people through um, prepare all of our students for the difficulties of what will um, lie afterward and um, yeah I always think about well what if what if another world was possible and I also know that in many workplaces extensions and missed deadlines are the reality and everyone's operating through that right and and so this idea of um, the university must be a place for for um, structure and and difficult learning and um, innovation, but at what cost and in what way? Um, I think all of these narratives are so so interesting and um, yeah, I, I really appreciate bringing that up. Um, again, so this what what you've been saying I think ties really nicely into uh, a lot of what your book talks about around retrofitting and how retrofitting and accommodation is not the solution or the path through um, that's going to be uh, most successful, most supportive, most um, affirming for many students with disabilities. Um, so 
reflecting on how students engage in the accommodation process and how students often have to navigate the balance of self-advocating while risking further stigmatization. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean around retrofitting and how your perspective on the inadequacy of retrofitted solutions impacts how you engage with students and the accommodations process um, as an educator? Sure. So I, I call the accommodations process a retrofit um, and I should define what a retrofit is. So basically like a retrofit is something that's added onto a product or a building after it's already been built. Um, and usually they're mandated, right? There's a, there's, nobody puts them on for fun, right? They're put on because you have to. Um, and they might kind of like update a uh, technology, right? We retrofit um, plants so that they don't pollute so much. We retrofit cars so that they don't pollute so much, right? Um, the, the idea is that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, right? But the other thing about a retrofit is that they don't alter the original uh, building. They don't alter the original technology, the original, um, you know, mechanism. It stays the same, right? And a retrofit, it kind of just allows it to stay on the road um, or, or stay functioning. Uh, and so to me, that's a powerful metaphor because I think that so much of the approach to disability accommodations is that they cannot disrupt the, the status quo. Um, they're temporary. They're mandated. Um, Nobody does them because they want to, right? People do them because they're forced to, and they're temporary. You know, what happens, it's a, like the Las Vegas thing. What happens for a student in one class stays in that class. The student needs to go and negotiate again, over and over again, um, for something that's temporary, right? And no lasting change to the kind of status quo. Um, I'll give you an example here. Like uh, I talked about the, the testing thing, right? So the University of Victoria, uh, just as one example, in the last year, they gave 18,000 extra time accommodations for exam tests and exams. 18,000, right? I would bet Queens is right there. And none of those accommodations would ever question why anybody is giving a time to test or exam, right? And, and we work at research institutions. There's no research in fact, all of the research shows that a time tester exam does not make students study harder or retain more information, right? Uh, uh, learn better or even reflect what we've taught better, right? So it's like a bad science experiment we keep doing over and over and over again, right? And we never question why we're doing it. In fact, we'd spend however much money on 18,000 tiny accommodations that just give an extra half an hour to an hour rather than saying, why are we doing this, right? Why is anybody giving a timed test or exam, right? To get to your example from earlier, nobody walks into an engineering firm and says, put your pencils down, whatever bridge you built is the one we're gonna you know, build. We don't have timed engineering, right? There are pressures, you know, et cetera, and so on, but we want people to be thorough thinkers. And, and you know what? We develop processes that allow people to do their best work. Um, but a time tester exam, it does not, it's not a good, it's so noisy. It's not a good reflection of what stu students even learned. Like as an instructor, you shouldn't want it because it's not even showing that, that you've done a good job teaching. Um, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, but that's, that's the retrofit approach. It's just temporary changes, right? Um, and, and to me, every time you're negotiating that change, you're also taking a risk, right? You're putting you're putting an identity that we know in our ableist cultures on campuses is stigmatized. You're, you're putting that out front. That's how you're introducing yourself to your new graduate supervisor. That's how you're introducing yourself to your new chair, um, to your new professor, and then 50 minutes later to the other new professor, right? Um, and so the other part of how it works then is people don't ask for accommodations. That's one of the goals of accommodations. I'm sorry, it's true. It's one of the goals of the system. Not too many people will ask for them, right? And that is extremely effective, right? So in Canada, the numbers tell us that about 24% of undergraduate students have disabilities and only 6% of them ask for help, right? 
94% of students with learning disabilities get some form of accommodation in high, in high school, and only 17% of those same students get any help at university, even though it's what helped them to get to university, right? Um, mo we, Canadian universities will, will never know, right? Two thirds of the students with disabilities that, that come through and either graduate or leave Canadian universities will never have disclosed ever or sought accommodations ever. And that applies to mental health as well, right? More than 45% of students who stop attending our universities because of mental health related reasons never asked for help, never sought accommodations, even though they have the right to them, right? And so we have this crisis. The other thing, the National College Health Assessment tells us that this current group of students, the two biggest things about this group that are different from the previous cohorts is one, they experience higher education itself as disabling more than other cohorts. And two, they ask for help less. So we have a system, this retrofitted accommodation system is very successfully not being used. Um, and we're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of good intentions on a system um, that students will never use, never utilize. And, and because of the way that it works, and sorry, I'm being pretty bleak here, but because of the way that it works in Ontario, Queen's University, you have Waterloo University. I, there's no incentive for us to believe that if a student drops out, it's our fault. If a student drops out at Queen's, next year they're replaceable with a smarter student. Every year you have more students apply there than the year before. And every year the average goes up for admission into the top most competitive programs. So every single student who's, who comes into a system that's not built for them, that struggles and leaves, it's their fault, right? And even though the, the what our universities look like is so drastically different now in terms of the students that are here, in terms of where they wanna go, in terms of the challenges they're gonna face over the course of their careers, it's so different than it was 30 or 40 years ago, but we teach the exact same way we did. Right. And the retrofitted system allows us to keep doing that. It doesn't say we should change what we do in this room based on whoever's in the room. Right. It says adapt yourself. Um, and that if you're struggling, that's your fault. And we know what cost that has at Queens and at Waterloo. You know, we've seen this. We've had giant consortiums of experts get together and say this is a mental health crisis. And we've seen students who we're close with die, right? And very little changes. Um, sorry, I know that that I went real dark there, but that's that's what we're dealing with, right? And I need to sort of say these things, and we need to say them to our colleagues so that they understand it's not just about the final line on a syllabus, right? It's about, in my calculation, you know, a huge loss of intellectual, cultural, social potential too. I'd say like 50, 60, 70,000 students a year we're losing and all the potential that they have, right? And, and we know the kind of future that they're up for and that's not fair, right? But also selfishly, we should care because we need them, right? Because we need their input. Um, I'll just say, just to pile on here a little bit, but like, um, only like 8% of disabled students are in STEM. So that's another thing. We need to look at this discipline by discipline. All those problems I talked about are exacerbated in particular disciplines. And, and you might say in disciplines in which we really badly need disabled students, researchers, faculty all the way up, right? Um, but that's not what's happening. The system is really very efficiently, um, you know, failing those students. Wow, thank you so much. I think um, what, you, what you were sharing about needing to understand the gravity of the situation at the same time as the value and the potential and the possibility that happens when, um, as educators, when as, as, academic places we we uh 
not just accommodate, but uh, encourage, elevate, properly support, properly resource, and continue to maintain that and sustain that. Um, I think that I, I very much resonate with both of those um, sort of perspectives of the gravity of if not, and as mm -hmm. things are, this yeah. is what happens. And yeah. look at what's possible if we get this yeah. right, or if we we try um, and we do a little bit more. Um, I was also really- yeah, th thinking, Thank you, because that's what I'm trying to, I really sure. appreciate you reiterating it that way, right? Because, you know, I, I really, I feel the same way. I feel like like we need to be very clear about the cost, right? And also clear about the the, the potential, you know, unbelievable like value right and importance of 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 doing the work right not just of you know let saying okay this is something that's out of our control because the other piece like i gave the example of those things for those students they're not big things they're things you know we didn't have to, we didn't figure them out under the right circumstances but we figured them out and they make a big difference right? Having a slightly different attitude around participation and attendance and deadlines. It's not a big thing. It's not revolutionary. You know, every workplace has already got there, right? Um, and we will, I do believe we will get there and that it will make a difference, right? And that there are other changes that we can make and none of them are drastic, right? Uh, we just, sometimes also we need to give one another permission to try things and to make changes. Uh, because we often teach the way we were taught and we do things because they were done to us. Um, and that feels safer. And I think Bell Hooks would say that's the, that's the trap, right? Yeah. Yeah, the teaching how you were taught, I think um, when I think about graduate level and um, uh, PhD level and postdoc level, uh, I think about how much of that rhetoric appears there of, you know, this is just how it is. And this is what my PhD was like. And this is what, you know, my master's was like. And so it's going to be hard in the same way, because there's this sort of, as you move through the ranks, so to speak, of post-secondary education, and you um, reach reach different sorts of levels or different sorts of accomplishments, there becomes that that different sort of and sometimes even more strict gatekeeping, not always, but sometimes. And, and um, I think that's really interesting too, when you, when you factor that in as well. Um, can I just, can yeah. I just add something on that? Cause I think the, the other piece is that, is that um, the whole system is controlled by people who were successful in the system, right? And, and those people, you know, whether they can recognize that the system was unfair or not is not really even the issue. It's that, to, to question the system means questioning their own privilege and abilities, you know, um, and that's hard. And that's, that, that is one of the things that really insulates universities against change uh, is that, that force. And it is a personal one, right? It feels very difficult for people to let go of that because it's a system that has rewarded them. Right. They've experienced it actually as, you know, Sarah Ahmed would say they've experienced it as flow. Right. They've been going with the flow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, too, to think about not just the systemic level or these these larger structures, but how people and individuals and relationally we take up this work of academic ableism and how a lot of it, a lot of students experience of academic ableism might exist on these larger scales of submitting paperwork and bureaucracy, but often the most, some of the most hurtful or impactful moments are relationally between a professor or a colleague or a peer um, where, where you encounter academic ableism and, and maybe it shocks you or surprises you and um, that sort of social fallout that might happen there too. Um, I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we've had some just, you know, even in Ontario, we've been a leader in some ways around some of that understanding of stigma and ableism, right? Like, you know, uh, there was a big case at York University around a student's right to, you know, ask for an accommodation, but not need to name their diagnosis, right? And that has now become general practice in Ontario that students can seek accommodation and they still need to give medical verification and so on. And we should talk about that. That's a problem. Um, but they don't have to name the diagnosis, right? At least that's one way of saying that like there is stigma, 
there is ableism on campus. Naming some disability diagnosis is very highly stigmatized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I have a question that's kind of ringing throughout all of all of the things that you shared with us today um, that is a little bit off script, but I'll try to, uh, if I get sure, it, that's so fine. Put it in the notes yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but I know at the beginning you were talking about how in your experience growing up and, and with your brother, um, you understood ultimately in some ways that inclusion is fake. And ultimately that some of these sort of narratives or these ideas about um, participation, inclusion, um, accommodation, or retrofitting even as well, that that some of these things fall flat. They they don't do what it is that they're promising to do. Kind of that, that disparity between a narrative or um, what's being shared and, and reality. Um, and I think uh, I'm wondering how you as an educator navigate taking these big ideas and all of these things that are really important to you and making sure that they don't fall flat, making sure that they actually are ultimately impactful and ultimately make their way into your relationships or in your engagement with students or with uh, peers or other faculty. Um, how do you bring this from sort of narrative to reality to really actualize disability justice? Wow, such a good question. I mean, Here's the thing, it's like, um, I would be incredibly naive to ever think I could ensure that. You know, like our, our institutions are so deeply fucked up, like, but also rhetorical, like, and, and they're so good at co-opting. Um, you know, like I, I'll be honest, like, like I, I want to talk about disability justice and I, and I know exactly what some of the problems with just a rights-based approach are, but we don't even have faculty policies for disability accommodation at most schools in Canada. And I know exactly how limited it would be to even have one, but I also know how much worse it is to not have one. I sound old fashioned. I sound like an old, you know, geezer now complaining, shaking my fist, but you know what I mean? Like, so I'm highly suspect all the time. Like deeply so. You know, we're working on my campus to talk about universal design. Well, okay. Um, it's a coalition of a very few people who are already using universal design, right? And I'm very suspicious that it's an initiative that the, that the upper admin likes because it would mean less accommodations, not more. Um, and I don't think they know what it means, right? But I think we actually cycle through trends and fads um, and they don't end up landing or making much difference for people in the classroom or in their careers or in their everyday lives. Um, so I don't have a way of ever thinking it's not fake. Like I work at a university, you know, everything the university does is you know, we need to be suspect of what's the motivation here, right? What, what does this mean? You know, um, that's a, I guess that's a hard way to live, but that's like where we are. Um, I mean, the, the key to it, the, the other big piece, and I didn't talk about this, but like, I just, I like, I enjoy teaching. And I think we work with the, the with the, the environments in which we we feel like we can have the, the ability to make changes, right? And take risks. And I'm very privileged to be able to do that in the classroom. Like I understand that it, there's a privilege to being able to make changes and do things differently and take risks, right? Um, to build a more inclusive classroom. Um, so that's it to me, um, is that ability to set up a classroom where I'm able to listen to students, not at the end of the term, but throughout the term and make changes as I go, right? Where I can say, you know, why am I assigning this much work and then drop an entire assignment? Or why have I been giving a grade for participation? What does participation mean? And who has that been harming, right? Um, and allow students to, to give themselves their own participation grades and, and create an inventory of the ways that they participate. Like, so I think it's in the classroom, it's in the teaching, right? 
It's in the relationship building that I do with other colleagues, right? Or even with staff who don't have an accommodation policy and yet are, you know, working in an ableist culture as well. Um, so it's not at the like higher levels there. I'm just really suspect of everything. Um, but it is still a play. The other thing, this will sound very Pollyanna-ish, but like universities have a lot of neurodiversity, right? We, we, it actually is a place where, you know, it's, it's terrible and ableist. And yet there's also a lot of unique ways of thinking and being and communicating. And, um, and so to me, there's potential in all of that as well. Um, but I don't think I, I can ensure that what I'm doing is as impactful as I want it to be. That's like, I just, yeah, I just can't, right? Like then I would be kind of congratulating myself. And I think you, you all can tell, like, I do have hope, <laughs> but it's always balanced with, with um, that worry. Yeah. I, I relate to that. Um, that sort of, uh, critical approach that we have to take to our own uh, critical reflection really of our own practice and being really honest about um perhaps congratulating or or uh over over inflating what it is that we think we've done or the impact that we've done without actually having student feedback to um refer back to of course encouraging ourselves and and understanding that this is hard and has many different layers and that, you know, small things can be really meaningful is important too, but yeah. make sure that we're not giving ourselves good feedback when our students haven't necessarily done that, or it doesn't really reflect in, um, in what they're saying about whether our class is accessible or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I think, but, and I think we all, we also, you know, you, we're all here, right? And so the other piece, we can't congratulate ourselves until we realize that there are a lot of other people who, who we'd like to be here, right? And that's another orientation I think that's really important is like trying to find ways, trying to find the right ways to even create the right argument and persuasiveness to get other people to change too, right? Like it, it's very easy as an academic to just stay in your lane, keep doing what you're doing. Right. But I think there's actually a responsibility, especially as we gather privilege in the institution to try to influence other folks. Right. To try to point out when there are, you know, inequities like this, to be loud sometimes, to take on the risk of being loud, louder sometimes. Right. And um, to try to through whatever means necessary, change the way people approach, right? Give people permission to, to, um, to change, right? But also be willing to point things out when they're wrong. Thank you. Yeah, I think, again, this, this fits super well with, with our final question before we open up to Q&A, which is really bringing it back to the work of Bell Hooks and the intention and kind of theme of this whole speaker series, which is teaching to transgress. Um, Bell Hooks encourages educators to use the classroom to transgress boundaries and emerge new possibilities. What are some of the boundaries that you attempt to transgress and what new possibilities do you hope emerge as a result? Sure, okay. And I thought about a couple of things here. First, I wanna point out like academic ableism uh, there is a, it's an open access book. It's free online. Um, there's an audio book version. It's free too. Like you can easily access it if you want to. Yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to sell it or something. It's free. But um, along with the book, there's also an, uh, um, a resource there that has like hundreds of teaching ideas, right? And part of my, my uh, thank you so much. And that, even if you could link to that, um, to the, to those teaching ideas, like part of the approach has to be a little evangelical. Like we need to just try some things, see what happens, right? And my belief is like that electronic curb cut effect. Like if we try some of these things that make a classroom more accessible, it's going to have unforeseen positive consequences for a wide variety of students, first generation college, university students, international students, right? Students with different linguistic backgrounds, students with different class backgrounds. You know, there are going to be things we learn from doing that. Right. And so I am kind of like evangelical about it. Like, let's each try to, some of these things out. Let's let's get together in teaching circles or groups. Try some different things. Right. Um, take some accommodations that you've had in a class 
that were just temporary and for one person, give them to everybody and see what happens, right? Um, those are not, the, and, and you're not committed to them. They may not work, but we can try, right? And so I've tried that over the last couple of years. I acknowledge that idea that I've really drastically rethought what I mean by attendance and participation. There are a variety of ways to be present, right? And to contribute. And so I've made some changes there. I'm glad to share some resources and policies from my syllabus and things like that about how I do that. But, but lots of ideas in that resource. And I think that's a place to start. I call it places to start, right? But I have two particular challenges that I see. Um, and I've talked about them already, but this is more of repeating. But the first to me is help seeking, right? I think we really do have a crisis of help seeking. For whatever reason, whether it's, it's that a lot of students went through pandemic learning in high school, right, that they're continuing to go through a pandemic that's not really being acknowledged in university. Uh, there's a lack of communication, for so many levels between administration and faculty and staff and students, you know, that we have disconnected campuses and we have students who are not seeking help and then we're losing them. Right. So I think at a certain point you have to say there's a problem with the help. There could be. Right. There's a problem with the entryway to help. Uh, and we need to reconceptualize that and think not just about disability, but think about mental health. Um, we know that 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 these that that student engagement and health sur sur surveys show us that students are experiencing really poor mental health in general. Right. And that that impacts students of color even more than others. Right. Black and indigenous students are, are you know, it's shocking when you see the disparities. Right. So to me, like, I can't not mention that, right? We need ways for people to seek help that aren't about accommodations at all, right? And ways for people to claim disability identity that are about culture, right? And that means like, it should be in the curriculum. It should be in the events we have on campus, not just this office where they're doing legal and medical stuff, right? Um, we need to build that and 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 we need to disable, uh, you know, as a disabled fac faculty member, I need to be around <laughs> and I need to be talking about it and I need to be building relationships. And and that's important, too. Right. Um, but then also. Right. The second piece is it builds directly on the first piece, but we need to center students and faculty with disabilities to help us design the university that we want to have. We need to listen more, right? Um, we need to understand that process, right? We need to ask disabled students to kind of like audit our programs and processes, right? They need to be at the center rather than marginalized, right? And that's the opposite of this approach in which disability was like unexpected or unwelcome. Um, and that's disability justice, right? So those are my two things, I guess, help seeking, right? And and really thinking carefully and differently about, about that. And that's one piece. Students with disabilities have a right to seek help, right? Um, a right to seek accommodations, a right to be seen on campus, right? Um, but on the other hand, they also should be the shapers of campus. Wow, thank you so much. I Those those two pieces around help seeking and, and also um, centering students and faculty members and staff with disabilities. I think those are so um, helpful. And I, I really look forward to looking at your places to start online resource. Um, I also really thought a lot about your, uh, your, attend your notes on attendance and participation. And uh, one of the things that I've heard frequently around um, faculty uh, looking to find new ways to uh, approach, approach pedagogy and ensure that it's, um, uh, really commit to accessibility within their classroom. They talk a lot about attendance and participation. And sometimes the thought of letting go of these things like a marked participation or marked attendance is really scary. And what I often think about is, um, I, I know that the, the stakes are much higher than this, and this is maybe a bit trivializing, but we we don't have a lot, like we have everything to lose. We have nothing to lose, so to speak, because what's happening right now isn't working. Um, this doesn't work. So if that doesn't work, then we're, still in the same place that we're at. Um, yeah, so really thinking about how uh, trying something and, and you know, maybe one of these resources or one of these suggestions that you have um, in that resource, that trying that, even if it's different and even if it changes something, um, and even if it doesn't work for your particular class, you're not, uh, nothing is lost, so.
Let me it, give just one. Let, let me give just one more example of that. Okay, because yeah. because I had an associate dean at Waterloo who sent an email around during the pandemic that they'd done a survey of students, which they never do, but students said how stressed they were, basically. And this associate dean said, assign less. And so I usually teach three major assignments in a writing class, and I now do two. I'll never go back to three. So to me, that's a big piece is like, actually, I think there's been a huge inflation in the demands of student time, attention, emotional labor, all these things. And we haven't even paid attention. Like we just keep thinking everything's so important. Every assignment is essential. Every reading is essential, right? And if you have enough teachers doing that, you get the state that we're in right now, right? Which is students don't have time to think or be creative or reflective, right? Um, they don't have time for, for the their other needs, right? And so I think that would be my other big major thing would be try an experiment of taking out a major piece of one of your courses. We, we come, I, I know I go to a million teaching week workshops and what we always feel is like, oh, I have to try this thing and that thing and the other thing, right? And I think, and I wouldn't have done it without permission. And I, I'm here supposed to be like the person who's an expert on this. And, you know, I wouldn't have done it if somebody didn't say I could. So maybe can I be the person who says you can, you can take out a major assessment, a major deliverable, right? And just see what happens and all the other learning that comes up around it, all the ways you can connect with students if you're not grading as much. It's okay, right? Um, give it a try. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm sure for many folks here, that permission is maybe the push that they needed to think about not just what they're going to add, but what needs, what, what do they need to get rid of um, or substitute instead? That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate um, this part of the conversation. And I'm really excited to continue and see um, what questions have emerged uh, with folks who are here watching and participating today. Um, if we can open up the chat, uh, 